recording? Good morning. Welcome to the second of our webinar series on AB 798 and preparing your proposal uh, for your uh, Open Textbook Adoption Award and Incentive Award. Sorry. Uh, today we're going to be running through a couple of different topics, uh, mobilizing faculty, uh, getting your working group together on campus, uh, promoting uh, OER and open textbooks to faculty and to the campus. Don't forget all of this information can be found at coolfored.org. That's cool, C-O-O-L, for the number, uh, ed, ed dot org. Uh, so let's begin. Um, <clears throat> one thing to keep in mind as you prepare your proposals and as you think uh, of your project and of the year ahead is that OER adoption can and should probably involve lots of different people and lots of different constituents. These obviously should include faculty who are teaching courses. Uh, librarians who have expertise in, uh, typically librarians have expertise in OER and instructional materials. Uh, you might also contact and uh, recruit a representative or folks from your local center for teaching and learning or similar faculty development site. Uh, if you're at a CSU, <coughs> California State University campus, and you have an ALS, Affordable Learning Solutions program on campus, obviously those folks should and probably want to be uh, included as well. Don't forget your bookstores. They do sell uh, textbooks to your students, and they can be very instrumental in transitioning uh, from publisher textbooks to open textbooks. Also, <coughs> uh, because most open textbooks or many open textbooks uh, involve, an, uh, involve an online or digital uh, component, uh, you want to get in touch with your tech services, your academic technology, your information technology, and or your e-learning uh, folks. You also want to get in touch with uh, your DPRC or your Disabled Student Services Office uh, because some of your students may need some extra help uh, in terms of accessibility and these textbooks. And lastly, but certainly not leastly, you'll want to get in touch with students, uh, and that is your student government or student leadership on campus. Hello, Al Woods from SDSU. How are you? Welcome. Um, moving right along, uh, I just want to run through a couple of uh, example breakdowns of how uh, the affordability uh, calculations work uh, and what they might look like on your campus. So let's take an example of a large course adoption. This would be general chemistry, where uh, this semester or the semester preceding your uh, AB 798 efforts, uh, instructors assigned a traditional text that costs students $235. But as part of your uh, uh, open, adopt, open textbook adoption uh, incentive plan, uh, you are adopting instead an OpenStax chemistry textbook, uh, which is an open textbook, which can be either printed and bound or available online. If you have four sections of 100 students, you are dropping the textbook cost per student from $235 to zero. That means for those four sections, you would have uh, about 100% savings or $94,000. The thing to keep in mind is that the threshold for uh, affordability under AB 798 is a 30% savings. So using this calculus <coughs> of open adoption versus previous adoption, uh, times the uh, number of students, uh, you have to achieve a ratio of 30%. I'm not going to go through the second one. Uh, this is a small course adoption, again, a 100% savings because the traditional textbook has been swapped out uh, for an open uh, textbook, which is free uh, for the students. Uh, let's just look at this third example. <clears throat> this is for a freshman year experience course where the traditional text is 20 bucks. Let's say you replace it with an uh, open textbook from Sailor, which is one of the big, uh, other big suppliers of open uh, free textbooks. Uh, you modify it, uh, you know, in the fall uh, through your faculty or professional development uh, 
uh, efforts, uh, and then you deploy it in the spring. Uh, and again, if you drop that cost from $20 to zero, you get 100% savings. Okay, any questions? You can uh, either use the microphone or you can type into the box if you have questions. There's also a little icon at the top of the Collaborate, uh, which uh, has a little hand. If you click on that, I'll know you're raising your hand, just like in a classroom. Okay, so I'm going to move on then. Uh, one of the, you know, one of the things uh, the plan should probably include, obviously. Oh, great. So uh, L. Woods uh, from S. Uh, San Diego State University said that one of those examples uh, matches uh, a scenario on their campus. So that's excellent. Now, don't forget these are new adoptions. You can't factor in old adoptions, so it has to be from 2015-16 to 2016-17. All right, uh, how to promote OER to faculty. This is a really important uh, point uh, because in order to generate savings at a scale, uh, you will have to get as many faculty involved as possible. And of course, you'll want the adoptions to stick. If the faculty adopts an open textbook in fall of 2016, you'll want that faculty member to continue using that open textbook. What are some ways to promote OER to faculty? Well, there's the traditional publisher's route, which is lanyards or other tchotchkes, you know, little gimmicks, gifts, uh, USB hard drives, uh, et cetera. Uh, you can take advantage of Open Education, Educational Resource Week, <clears throat> which is a kind of nationally organized uh, week, uh, and plan events on campus around uh, your program. Uh, you can find ways to recognize OER use on campus. Uh, you want to uh, find faculty, obviously, ready to change. I'll talk about that a little bit later. You can use social and traditional media. I think this will depend, you know, kind of on your campus and what works best on your campus. Do people use Twitter? Uh, are postcards, uh, you know, most effective, et cetera? Take advantage of other campus events. You also want to link up with uh, the folks, so to speak, at the top, uh, that is provosts and deans. Uh, and really importantly, I think, at least in my experience, department chairs, who obviously have a much greater sense of uh, the needs of their faculty and the courses they offer in their departments. Also, don't forget the Academic Senate. The Academic Senate has passed a resolution probably this spring to get the ball rolling uh, on your RFP. So you might as well go back to the Academic Senate and take advantage of the Senate, the Senate floor, and the Senate standing committees or university committees uh, as a way to promote OER to faculty. Obviously, faculty are extraordinarily creative and imaginative, so I'm sure your campus will come up with some really exciting ways uh, to promote uh, and involve faculty in OER. And please do let us know uh, about those, uh, you know, those uh, means that you devise. Why should faculty adopt OER? I think we ran, we kind of ran through this on, in the first webinar, or at least I did in my first version of the webinar. Um, obviously, one important reason is affordability. Lowering the cost of textbooks makes uh, the cost of attending higher education, attending your university or college, uh, much more affordable for students. Um, and that, of course, will be a very persuasive argument uh, for all kinds of folks on campus. There are arguments that affordability and lowering the cost uh, of uh, higher education can also increase retention. Um, that is students sticking around uh, on your campus and in your programs. The quality of OER and open textbooks has increased and is growing. This is uh, really true. The state of OER and open textbooks has significantly changed over the past 10 years. And uh, if you look at the open textbooks we've curated on Cool for Ed, which is our online collection, uh, I think you'll see that uh, the quality is as good as, if not better, than publishers' textbooks. Uh, another thing uh, to keep in mind is that uh, a campus project like yours gives uh, faculty uh, an opportunity to collaborate with others uh, within uh, and across disciplines. And depending on your campus culture, this can be uh, a very attractive incentive for folks. Uh, you have a chance, faculty have a chance to publish in an emerging area. Uh, Although AB 798 does not support the creation of OER materials, uh, 
<clears throat> there is an opportunity, <clears throat> obviously, to customize and modify existing OER materials to fit your curriculum. And that also, I think, gives faculty a greater sense of control uh, over their classrooms and their curriculum. And you know, given the interest in OER worldwide, globally, as well as within the state, uh, faculty who reflect on uh, and write about their OER experience can find outlets for that uh, you know, kind of work. It also gives faculty a chance to re-examine and reflect on their teaching and to redesign their teaching. Uh, and that's why some of the faculty development and professional development support in AB 790 I think is so important because it's not just about OER textbook adoption, although it is, but it also offers opportunity for faculty to get together and to think about what they're doing, what they like to do, um, and uh, you know, enter into conversations about redesign. Also, one thing we noted from some surveys and work we did on an early <clears throat> on early adopters of OER within uh, CSU and the community colleges is that some faculty are very interested in the way OER supports multimodal teaching. That is because the textbook is online, because you can remix it because you can add to it and supplement to it because it's you know, creative uh, license uh, through Creative Commons, that opens up for some folks uh, some really exciting possibilities to bring in videos, to bring in primary materials, et cetera, and link those uh, to the textbook and to the course. Okay, so those are some of the reasons why faculty should adopt uh, OER. Any questions? Okay, I'm going to keep on moving then. I'm going to keep on trucking. All right, <clears throat> I would encourage you, if you go to the Cool for Ed site, we have some really interesting, and in the, <clears throat> pardon me, first toolkit, the toolkit is a kind of quick uh, set of informative links and topics that we've assembled to help people fashion uh, their request of their RFP. Uh, you'll see we have links to some very successful and interesting campus uh, OER programs. Uh, and those include uh, the programs at Humboldt State uh, and CSU San Marcos. So I encourage you to go and look at those. Uh, you can see how they structure their programs, kind of get a sense of the dynamics of the programs, and also get some really uh, interesting and engaging commentary from faculty who are involved in those OER initiatives. One thing to keep in mind is that on your campus, you already have resources uh, that you can use uh, in your RFP uh, in, in your program, your open textbook program. Um, one of those resources is the bookstore. Uh, so it's good to get in touch with them early in the process uh, as you start to create uh, your proposal because folks in the bookstore, you know, uh, have a lot of experience with textbooks and publishers. They have a good sense of the fit between courses and textbooks, supply uh, and demand. Uh, they have a good sense of which courses uh, are in need of a refresh or which courses look like they might be, uh, you know, provide opportunities for refreshing um, uh, books, uh, et cetera, materials. Um, and the bookstore also probably has some experience with things like print on demand. Uh, so if you want to print an online book, have it bound, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so uh, hook up with your bookstore or with your bookstore committee <clears throat> and let them know what's going on and get them involved in the process. The library, again, <clears throat> most librarians, or many librarians rather, have experience with OER, open access publishing, and that kind of world of open uh, texts uh, and materials. So you'll want to get in touch with them and kind of get them involved in the uh, initiative uh, as early probably as you can. Um, they're also obviously uh, very expert at managing and setting up library reserve uh, systems, or sometimes at, at arranging printing services, providing textbooks for checkout, uh, et cetera. Many of you probably already know this, but it's just good to remind you uh, that the library is a very valuable resource uh, as you start to think about your OER and open textbook adoption program. You want to, I think, also connect with your instructional designers or your e-learning people on campus. Um, these folks are often already involved in course redesigns. Uh, they're also very familiar with the LMS or learning management system, so they can help uh, integrate OER materials into that LMS. 
Um, and they're also very aware of accessibility issues. And I mean accessibility in terms of uh, compliance with ADA uh, standards and protocols, et cetera. So again, another very valuable resource you have on campus. And then there's technology services. Um, and because many of the open textbooks or OER materials are online or in digital format, it's always good to check in with technology services, let them know what's going on, get their participation uh, in their feedback, et cetera. Okay, anything else? Any questions? Concerns? Okay, uh, recognitions and rewards for OER. You can see that this page is blank. Does that mean there are no recognition and rewards uh, for OER? No. What it means, I think, really is that the way in which you recognize and reward folks for adopting open textbooks and OER, I think, really depends on the campus and the campus culture, uh, et cetera. Um, so, you know, whether you want to use the Senate as a vehicle for this, uh, whether you want to use local campus publications, whether you want to, <coughs> you know, get in touch with department chairs uh, and talk to them about recognition and reward, I really think that's up to you and your campus and your knowledge and expertise about your campus uh, and how it works. Okay, I think that's it. Let me just run back through the slides here <coughs> in case I missed anything. <coughs> Excuse me, I have something caught in my throat here. And no, I think we're good. I think that's about, you know, uh, the lay of the land as it stands uh, today. So uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Concerns, maybe, uh, oh, what about, so L.W. Woods of San Diego State asks, what about sending faculty to, say, for instance, the OER conferences? Yes, that's a great idea. <clears throat> um, I, I think you mean the ones that are being sponsored by or partnered with uh, the CSC Chancellor's Office. I think it would be very helpful. There was one, I believe, already in Long Beach or shortly to happen in Long Beach. There's another one. Uh, at UC Davis uh, that's coming up soon. Um, yeah, uh, you should definitely send folks to the conferences. Um, I don't know if you want to send folks out of state. <clears throat> as part of AB 798, uh, the council, as well as the chancellor's office at CSU, uh, together are organizing various uh, conferences and get-togethers, which are focused on AB 798 and getting programs up and running. So again, go to the Cool for Ed site <clears throat> and you'll see a list of uh, conferences, local conferences, and get-togethers. But those can be very helpful. I went to Open Ed in Vancouver in the fall and it was a really exciting and uh, uh, helpful opportunity, inspiring really, uh, to start thinking about OER and education, teaching, and learning. Yes, uh, L.W. Woods from San Diego State Give me another question. Uh-huh. Oh, that's a really good question. <clears throat> so the question is, uh, uh, yeah, we have a faculty member who wants to use an OpenStack book for chem, but she wants to pilot first in the summer. And the question is, can we claim this for the fall when she extends to 900 students? Um, the, my answer to that question is simple. I don't know. Uh, but it's very interesting. Um, and my intuition is that you probably can. But don't take my word for it. Let me double check about the relationship between summer session and uh, the fall semester. Uh, there could be some real technical kinds of you know, issues involved in that only in terms of, you know, the relation between summer session and academic year. Yes, I agree. Summer session does seem like a really logical, uh, smart place uh, to kind of begin the piloting process before you scale it up to 900 students. So I'll tell you what, if you can email, I think Teresa put the email, uh, no, so uh, if you can email me, I'm going to write my email here. Email me. And I will check um, or email cool4ed at cbl.edu 
and I will check on the answer to that question. Okay, and I will get back to you very promptly, I guarantee it. <clears throat> Any other questions? Teresa is going to make a note of the questions. Well, Teresa is our uh, administrative uh, person. <clears throat> and so we have the question, and we will get back to you. Okay. Well, if you do have uh, if you do have questions or concerns or whatnot, please do go to the Cool for Ed site. Uh, there's lots of material there. Get in touch with us. Uh, I think we'll be having office hours and further webinars, so you can check back in at a future webinar. Uh, and the schedule is up at coolfored.org. So everybody have a nice day. Enjoy, and uh, keep working on those proposals. Thanks. Adios.